Alrighty, so it's one of those days where the Technus Corner meets its counterpart, United in Tech, the podcast, up and coming people. It's about to begin. I apologize for what is to be ahead in a second's time, which is complete and utter mayhem as I get my bearings with this podcast on my uh, lonesome United in Tech podcast episode official number four. We're back. We're back, people, and let's get started. So, yeah, welcome back to the Technus Corner. I'm your host, Sabluka, today for United in Tech podcast official number four. It's been... It's been a fair few months and cutting a long story short and bringing it over to the Technus Corner of a podcast. So from every week or every two weeks, we shall have the news rounded up, buttercup versions of it, uh, a little bit easier to digest. What's relevant in the PC space, in the PC world, united in tech, guys. We stand united in tech and it's podcast number four. So let's get into it. Let's go. So cutting a long story short, people, we've got some interesting news, not necessarily developments. I promise in the weeks to come, it'll be all up to date. I'll be my usual self where I will be delivering the news one, two, three days in advance before the big wigs, the other wigs, the other tech influencers, I'd say, and or not necessarily journalists per se, but I'll be, you know, with my sources releasing information that is privy to only some at at the time of sourcing so that you guys, my viewers and the Technus Corner community can come to grips with what's coming up next in our PC genre and space, the PC subspace, which is the personal computers people. So with that being said, Today's not all fun and games, but at the same time, you know, there is some direct shit in relation to direct storage that we have to talk about. Uh, it's finally here. Who's it here for? Uh, we've also got a game that's being featured and some CES news that we missed uh, that's still relevant for everybody, especially the 150 subscribers uh, I hit that like and sub button guys especially the subscribe button it helps me in many ways to produce content for you all this is just me getting back into united in tech podcast official number four today and yeah apart from that there's a couple of little bits little little easter eggs which we'll bring up as we get to it it's going to be a video affair in relation to what we have for you today yeah let's get cracking and hopefully I can uh, work out what's going on with these scenes. So here we go. Get us all warmed up, I'd say. We've got Forspoken, and I've actually downloaded the demo, people. So yes, I've got the game, not official, the whole thing, but it was released. It was released on the 24th of January, only a few days have passed since release. And the demo, the PC and PlayStation 5 demo was also released. And it's essentially to titillate you all. Well, the PC demo was released on the 24th to titillate you all into wanting to buy it. Forsaken, just to give you guys a rundown before we get into what is essentially the gameplay video official. And it goes for about 10, 15 minutes. So we're not going to get a chance to watch all of it. We'll stop it in due time. But Forsaken has been developed with the help of the Unreal Engine 5. Uh, Luminous Productions and Square Enix are bringing forth Forsaken, which will feature a massive open world with magic that players can explore and an engaging storyline. Forsaken has been developed on Unreal Engine 5. And all gamers look forward to what this engine can bring to the table. Or spoken, built on Unreal Engine 5, and we're going to get into a little bit of what 5.1 just came out in relation to Unreal Engine 5 after we take a look at Forspoken. But I'm just giving you guys a lead up because it's all leads into the next 
it funnels into the next set of news that we're going to be looking into essentially so the unreal engine is quickly becoming a standard in-game virtual product creation unreal engine 5 is a prominent gaming engine used by game development companies teams are given the authority to construct large structures creators across sectors may co-operate in real time to provide exceptional images and experiences and that's why what draws me to Forspoken is its open world. So that being said, before we get into the video, just to give you all a little bit of context, Forspoken has been developed with the help of Unreal Engine 5, Luminous Productions and Square Enix will reveal what this engine is capable of. Forspoken is set in open world and who doesn't love open world games? Well, if you're bored of the open world, how does this sound? An open world game with magical spells. What will Forspoken be like? Well, we're about to find out, but most of the exciting elements of Forspoken gameplay is the magic. Since the map of Aethia provides a massive open world for us, players can commute with magic. Frey can use a form of magical parkour that allows her to zip across the landscape at high speeds and Frey's the uh, main instigator here i'd say um and or character she's not an instigator but in relation to it like let's let's not talk about it let's actually put on the gameplay video and have a look at what actually is going on it is quite beautiful yeah and uh everything here wants to kill you kind of way Let's change this visual. So I'm seeing this for the first time with you guys. Like honestly, uh, and she gets she gets taken away from New York City and dropped into this world. This is only 720p, guys. I apologize about that. I will be playing the game in 4K. So yeah. But magic for traveling excites us less than using magic to beat enemies into a flump. Combat is for, combat in Forspoken also features magic. There will be over a thousand spells the players will keep unlocking with their mana. Spells operate in both a defensive and offensive manner, meaning that players must combine Let's different finish. kinds of spells, taking down their enemies while ensuring they don't receive too much damage. And check this out, guys. This is Unreal Engine 5. Sort of like Devil May Cry sort of stuff. And already released January 24th. So let's... Let's, let's. Is that a cat? Alrighty. So yeah, magic, magic, magic galore. That being said, I've got the demo. The demo is available through Steam, Epic, as well as uh, the Microsoft Store, I believe. So if you guys are interested in Forspoken, it seems to be a very, very pretty game that is sort of more hack and slash, but magic orientated, mana depletion wise. Thousands of spells that essentially you're going to get through. And enough looking into this because at the end of this podcast, I shall be playing the demo for the first time. The demo is about 35 gigabytes in size. It's a, quite a vast demo. I believe gameplay from start to finish goes for at least half an hour or so. So there's plenty to get your juices sort of flowing, but not enough that from my understanding, there's like more prominent spaces available in the actual game itself. 
which people will enjoy far more than what just the bland demo essentially brings because you have to remember it's a demo they're not going to give you all the juicy stuff instantaneously but that being said let's move on to the next thing i wanted to uh showcase and that was unreal engine and not just unreal engine 5 but unreal engine 5.1 in our next the first video. major update for unreal engine 5 just released called 5.1 and it is a huge deal the reason why is one word and that is foliage since unreal engine 5 came out it introduced a revolutionary new way of rendering geometry called nanite to briefly sum up nanite every object you see in computer graphics is composed of tiny flat planes of geometry called polygons and the more polygons you have in your environment the longer it will take to render this is why video games have developed a system called a level of detail, or LOD for short. The further away an object is from the camera, the less polygons it will use to render that object. This makes games run faster since there's less polygons that have to be rendered, but it is very time consuming to create all those LODs. So keeping this in mind, just, uh, just a little drop in relation to it. Unreal Engine 5 is the most recent incarnation of the very successful and popular gaming engine, and it's expected to find widespread use as the current console generation evolves. The updated version represents a significant advancement in geometry, lighting, and animation. Several high-profile and lesser-known titles have been confirmed to use the platform. During the State of Unreal 2022 event, Epic Games made Unreal Engine 5 open to all game developers for use in the following projects. Tomb Raider, The Matrix Awakens, Redfall, Stalker 2, The Witcher, Kingdom Hearts 4, Quantum Era. So what is the most advanced gaming engine you might actually be asking? Well, Unreal Engine 5 is, well, 5.1 now is, and it just gets more advancements continue to happen all the time. And this is something that we're going to talk about with the foliage in relation to 5.1 and how drastically it improves. It improves on the vi the visible clarity and foliage in general, the, the, the 3D effect of it and how it actually interacts with you in the world, but also uses less power and resources to render. So you can have better graphics now, essentially with less resources being required from you, like your GPU being pegged, to be able to perform this stuff. So as you know, other things get harder and to utilize on our hardware, Unreal Engine is very proactive in its approach in refining its software so that it uses less and less power essentially, you know, so that most of the next generation console games released on the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X are built using the Unreal Engine 5. AAA titles mostly used for the Unreal Engine. The engine was developed by Epic Games 25 years ago as a backdrop, and since then they have helped the biggest gaming companies to drop one masterpiece after another. Forspoken came out on January the 24th, and regardless of who you think created it and or where it's developed and whatnot, Unreal Engine 5 has had a big say in its being released on both PS5 and the pc just in january 24th passing so check out the game guys because it also utilizes something that we're going to touch on in a second and that's direct storage but just a little bit more about unreal engine 5 we know how breathtaking it is but and there are millions of them without a single lod being used the biggest issue with nanites is that it did not work with foliage this means we still have to rely on level of detail for foliage like shrubs, grass, and trees. Trees generally use billboards as the lowest level of detail, which is just a flat plane with a texture that, as you can see, does not look very like, nice. Like sort of like World of Warcraft. Here is an of what War, a billboard War, looks World like. Warcraft 2. We have Unreal Engine 5 opened up, and in this environment, all the trees are using level of details because that was the only option. Now, if I move my camera far away, this is what I'm talking about. That the trees it's like the texture change is changing until they are using billboards, and the transition. And it looks pretty bad. Pretty terrible. Notice how guys, even yeah. the shadows disappear because billboards only block light if it's facing it. But watch this. Now in Unreal Engine 5.1, we finally get Nanite Foliage. To enable Nanite on Foliage is pretty simple. You want to open up the stash 
and within here make sure enable nanite support is turned on and this is unique for foliage select preserve area that's how if we aren't too far away the object won't disappear and then press apply changes i went ahead and did the exact same process the whole all forest. the trees in this environment now when the camera Look flies away there is no lod transitions and you can go in ports. and they completely the retain the same quality as if they're being viewed up close and you can and the including climate here at long distances there is no loss in performance like the wind in and fact, everything we gained an extra five frames they so gained more five performance frames. Than LODs. it's unbelievable so nanite not only looks better it runs better in certain scenarios here's another example showing the power of nanites this is what it looks like without nanites the level of detail is noticeable because you can see that in the distance the trees are just textures yeah they are. also the lighting is casting incorrect shadows and this is the same environment but with nanite enabled price and remember this is only 720p no guys faked by inaccurate textures all the trees are real geometry that exists in the world and we did not lose any performance i wanted to push the limit of nanite foliage look so we so did the I whole forest, forest that is four square kilometers in total there's over 100,000 trees in this environment and i'm still 000. getting decent performance and as a reminder, this is all in real time. This level of density was only possible in pre-rendered movies. Also, it makes life easier. We don't need several different versions of an object for LODs anymore. On top of Nanite, Amazing. foliage that, now guys. interacts with light accurately. In real life, light passes through or bounces out of leaves, creating subsurface scattering. Previously, this did not work with UE5's lighting, but now it does. This is foliage in Unreal Engine 5.0. Notice how the shadows are too dark and unrealistic and here's foliage in unreal engine 5.1 now light is passing through the leaves and illuminating the ground which looks a lot nicer this is a subtle change but it does make a big difference and this is what i'm referring to when it comes to unreal engine 5 5.1 uh, and it, it goes further still like they've got uh mirrors in relation to the way objects are centered but yeah essentially this is what this is next level and these these tools by the way are available to everybody currently you just have to load up an epic games account and not play fortnite for a little bit and you can get into developing your own indie games they've got these like demo demo parts where you can sort of start off like developing a game similar to fortnite and or a first person shooter almost instantaneously and you can yeah it's 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 really really awesome stuff for both indie and triple a development titles and whatnot uh unreal engine 5 so this is what forspoken is based on and let's uh go to the next video per se <clears throat> i'm just so disappointed now i'm i'm actually very because pc world uh recently discussed this topic PC world there's Gordon and Adam and that's Brian from BPS customs uh he's a special guest on PC world they, they will be discussing well let me play it because it leads us into what is another massive thing that's finally come available with Forspoken and that's the game is designed to be able to implement direct storage and with that being said guys and girls why did the PC gamer upgrade to Windows 11? Because they heard it had direct storage and they were tired of waiting for their games to load. Direct storage was meant to be developed for Windows 10, but hey, how else will they bring us all on over? So with that said, I leave you with one more thing before we listen to what is essentially the same debacle of affairs, sort of cynicism in relation to how Microsoft and Direct Storage has been released because uh, why did the PC gamer upgrade from Windows 10 to Windows 11? Because they heard it was the 11th hour for their old operating system. So essentially, Direct Storage, if you don't know what it is, an easy way to understand Direct Storage is for me to say it in the most layman's way I can. And that is uh, Windows 11 includes a feature called Direct Storage that is designed to improve the performance of games by reducing the load on the storage subsystem. 
Okay, so direct storage aims to improve game loading times and reduce in-game stuttering by offloading certain tasks from the storage system to the GPU. So it offloads it from the CPU essentially to the GPU and straight away it comes out of what you hopefully have fast NVMEs. So it just goes from bang, bang. And that can be low times that can be drastically cut in half and that can be from like two two three seconds to 1.5 one second load times and if load times matter in relation to getting back into a game fast enough so that you can continue to frag that's a massive point a plus but also back in a time when yeah like 30 second load times you know you're not going to this ain't going to work on a hard drive you're going to have to have an nvme and, and applicable hardware already with that being said it's I'll just play this so that you guys can understand the sentiments involved in relation to it. Gordon pretty much sums it up in the first first five to ten seconds, and we won't play much of this because I will be explaining essentially what direct storage is to you guys so that I already have, but there's, there's not much more to it. There is a lot more to it, and there's politics involved as well, to be brutally honest, but we're not going to get that far into it today. Gordon, what, what are you what are you so disappointed in? We're we're live now. Well, because there has been this sort of seesaw back and forth information as to whether direct storage would be supported on Windows 10, and definitely the impressions from a lot of people were that it, it was going to be available, but now it is apparently not available. Right, so we'll have to get into that in the show. But he hello, hello, friends. Yes, yeah, so they get into it into the show. Essentially, like I said, it's not available for Windows 10. It was originally developed for Windows 10 and it was meant to be released with Windows 10 before Windows 11 became a thing. This was in the pipeline a while back. I was I was reading this from the Microsoft web pages themselves. Okay. They may still even have this available there. This was actually meant to be for Windows 10 and released on Windows 10 officially. Microsoft said this originally. Okay, so it's not to say that they can't do it, but supposedly the banter is that they maybe can't, they won't develop it as soon, they'll leave it to the end, and then, you know, by then it won't be a necessity. Also, games have to adopt this as well, so it's not something that you can back catalog, but also texture-wise, things like that, they essentially get into it, and PC World, the most current stream, uh, they talk about it in depth for about 30 minutes. You have Dr. Ian Cutrus um, from Tech Tech Potato make an appearance in the chat and they really go to town. Also from Ananda Tech, there's a good article which Gordon references, which helps with dissecting the terminology they use. But essentially, like I said, it's just reducing load on the storage subsystem and it's a direct storage aims to improve the game loading times and reduce in-game stuttering by offloading certain tasks from the storage system to the GPU, which is much quicker to handle these tasks than the CPU. And it doesn't have to circumnavigate around the CPU. The whole point is it goes direct and then the CPU can be utilized for other things still um, if if available to it um, and hopefully not uh, made null and void and forgotten. So for Spoken is the first game that enables you to be able to essentially play, essentially play a direct storage title that's not on ps5 for example and yeah because this has already been implemented in some ways in consoles and it's finally being implemented in windows but only for windows 11 and applicable correct hardware and games that support direct storage also which will be coming into the near future all games should hopefully adopt it you think so that leads us to another topic, and that's AMD video cards, essentially, because uh, direct storage or not, you guys may have heard that there has been plenty of flavor flavor and ammunition going AMD's way in relation to... Hello, everyone, and welcome to Chris Fix Germany. In this video... We'll... So this is Chris Fix uh, in Germany, and he was the one that brought to attention about 40 or 50 of these amd cards clustered they all came with broken silicon literally the gpu dice were blistered and popped and this was essentially a massive issue in the last few weeks if you had an amd card the most the only common strand that chris fix this guy from germany could find was in relation to 
the fact that the latest drivers that were released were the common strand. And this went about for a good few days where luckily he didn't actually, ent he didn't entice a riot, but there was a shitstorm of people jumping on the bandwagon saying AMD drivers are killing your cards. Got to be careful, but you have to be careful with these things because, you know, you want to be, you want to be savvy in the information that you get. But this was very quickly uh, subdued because it turned out that the cards that were sent to this gentleman here to be examined were a massive sample that came from the same place. And what place was that? A place that was essentially an ex-mining facility that then was having them stored in humid environments which caused degradation and damage to the cards excessively so where they just weren't cared for essentially after the fact and these were extreme humid environments that these cards were not only running in but also then stored in after the fact okay so even then they had you know and this is what caused them to all buster up and get damaged they got offloaded and sold by the same vendor and then off to these places in Germany in relation to these cards. Now, so the people that were running around saying it was the drivers, drivers were going to you know destroy your cards. There was a chance that there was some sort of voltage regulation thing that had occurred that um, you wanted to worry about and roll back to drivers. Even Jay from Jay's sense said, roll back the drivers, you know, but it, it didn't make sense. He got to the bottom of this rather quickly because this is the other commonality that came up to play after he started digging himself, this gentleman. He wasn't enticing a riot. He was just simply asking because he's the guy who's fixing the stuff. So if he gets 40 or 50 cards coming in, 6800s, 6900s, okay, the 6000 series were being affected here in relation to this, then he had to ask the question and he, he put out his feelers to the communities and everyone sort of jumped on the bandwagon that the drivers were terrible. You know, the drivers may be terrible from AMD at times, but they're not that terrible, I don't believe. I don't think they're that negligent. Um, I actually got a little bit worried that they were nerfing their cards already that quickly. Um, but yeah, with that being said, uh, Chris Fix from Germany is someone, if you want to follow up on this article and find the truth and what ended up happening to be just miners, of course, Good old fashioned miners causing GPU havoc to everybody. And yeah, like speaking of AMD uh, GPUs and whatnot, we had CES recently also passes by. So all, all the software in relation to, so just backtracking, all the adrenaline drivers and what uh, come in a suite now, and it's it's quite robust in that like if you don't mind the fact that you have to open it up at times and that and it's there it 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 can really you can do a, a lot of damage to your card if you want to to an nth degree because it's got all the overclocking capabilities as well built in and it's really robust so i actually don't mind where amd's gone with this and the newest adrenaline drivers have just been released as well uh, which supersede the ones that were in question in relation to in relation to the AMD's uh, thing, and they're specially designed for Forspoken out of all things. So we've got we've got Forspoken here and AMD Radeon uh, drivers, as well as uh, another spiel happening from CES in relation to Super Resolution Two and Fidelity FX and how this is running on a 7900 XTX in 4K high res ultra high. I'm um, hopefully I should be able to have it running at least 60 frames on 4K. Like I, I should you not because Unreal Engine 5. Like the whole point was Unreal Engine 5 is meant to be fairly forgiving on cards, um, especially if you haven't got like RTX and stuff enabled okay so that's something to look at and with direct to storage it should be even more applicably able to load textures and whatnot in relation to the game per se but yeah that being said ces and amd is another big thing that just recently passed the last couple of weeks ago we had ces 2023 and amd we've got some footage here in relation to amd as well so yeah, with that being said, y'all, uh, that lends us into uh, CES and AMD's 
part in it and more specifically the desktop space because some things that you may have noticed have become available in recent and or shall be if they're not available as of yet because release dates i'm not 100 percent sure on like i said i'm just getting back into the news of uh the news of things um even though i've got some sources with juicy information i always take for granted the fact that i can <clears throat> get this information before other other outlets release the information so yeah that's something that um i'm going to try to bring to the table for you all but with that being said let's get into what is lisa sue good old amd ceo and let's listen to what she has to say in relation to okay lots of systems will be out there but now let's move into desktops and i know a few of you may be waiting for some desktop chips but perhaps right Yes? No? Maybe? <laughs> so one of the biggest recent um, innovations in gaming PCs has been our introduction of 3D vCache memory technology in our Ryzen 5800 X3D CPUs last year. So you may have remembered this. The 5800 X3D was very, very popular chip. And if it was for gaming, it was IPS gains. They had to lower the frequency, top frequency of the chip per se, against the 5800X. But what they gained was a lot of cache and caching ability uh, on the stack, which was a 3D stack that they're actually building 3D chiplets. You know what I mean? So this is really impressive stuff, guys. And finally, we're getting a release on the new versions of these also what lisa is about to explain to us is something very very impressive as well which has got my my uh juices watering a little bit and i'm feeling a little bit moist not because it's hot in here but because of this what we did is we used 3d packaging to stack memory on top of cpus to deliver substantially more performance in gaming when Ryzen 7 uh, 5800X3D launched, it launched as the world's fastest gaming processor. And tonight, I'm very excited to announce that we are now bringing 3D vCache technology to our Ryzen 7000 processors. The Ryzen 7 7800X3D is eight cores, 16 threads, up to five gigahertz frequency, and 104 megabytes of cache, which more than doubles the cache compared to the Ryzen 7700X non-X3D uh, non version. And these larger caches are important, especially in gaming. Now, in ADP gaming and whatnot, but what she comes out with, the bigger niggling question is whether the 12 core and the 16 core chips are going to have 3D caching as well. And that's something that was not available on the 5000 series. We only had a 5800 X3D. Uh, and it looks, it looks like it's lead. She leads you to believe that perhaps it's not the case this time around as well. But surprise, surprise, let's listen to the rest of this. Let's take a look at some of this performance. The 7800X3D delivers on average 15% more performance than the 5800X3D across popular games. Is that okay? <laughs> but guys, as great as the 7800X3D is, I've had a lot of our fans asking me for even higher end options. So for tonight, I'm very happy to announce that we're also no. bringing 3D vCache technology to 12 and 16 core Ryzen 7000 processors. That's madness. That's absolute madness. Look, 16 core, 32 threads, up to 5.7 gigahertz boost. Okay, 144 megabytes of L2 and L3 cache. We've been working hard on this. The Ryzen 9 7950X3D is our first 16-core Ryzen processor with vCache technology and our fastest 3D stack chip ever. It features 16 high-performance CPU cores, boost speeds up to 5.7 gigahertz, and a huge 144 megabyte cache. So let's take a look at some of this performance. In 1080p gaming performance versus the competition, you can see that the... 
and this is in 1920 1080p this is high performance in relation to esports titles as well and that so your i9 13900k um high image quality preset on 1920 by 1080 so that this is the cpu essentially doing the nitty-gritty not in relation to your gpu which will factor in more on higher resolutions um, but you don't want your cpu to be a bottleneck and 4090s for example they every cpu is a bottleneck for a 4090 you get me this cpu specifically might help bring up that that bottleneck that uh, that exists and that difference between the 4090 now which is the pedigree gpu to be brutally honest but who can afford one realistically a 4090 is massive in relation to a 4080 4070 ti uh 7900 x tx 49 is where do you want to be guys but have we got the three three and a half thousand dollars in australia to buy one of these that's another story 7950X3D is faster across a wide range of games, consistently delivering much higher frames per second, which makes this the ultimate processor for gamers and creators. So when you think about processors, you also need great games. And what I'd like to show you now is one of the most anticipated new games of 2023, Star Wars Jedi Survivor from our friends at Respawn. You know, this title has actually been developed on Ryzen, and it's been optimized for Ryzen processors. So let's take a look at some gameplay footage. So another awesome game that's being released as well in conjunction with AMD Ryzen and whatnot and will probably perform better on, on this said hardware. But they're catching up. They're catching up in so many different ways. It's, you know, it's very difficult to nudge of NVIDIA in relation to the graphics cards and whatnot. That being said, another thing at CES that was relevant, I believe, uh, that we should, that everyone should know about is, it was also covered by Gordon from PC World who exclusively seemed to uh, interview the gentleman because I'll tell you what, the PC World coverage and the one of their latest videos in relation to the coverage on this topic has become one of their largest videos ever in such a short period of time they finally had another hit honestly because uh pc world like gordon's like the goat right so if we move forward to this video now hey, hey, gordon with pc world here i'm with dr seshu matt have that's right i'll let i'll let him explain exactly what it is but it's a new form of cooling essentially and this cooling is it just blows your mind the technology guys uh you have to watch at least a little bit of this to understand what's going on because essentially it's on a nano mon mo molecular level and these little devices have more more power than our fans do in relation to passive in relation to assertive cooling and whatnot just they just have to be positioned in the right places and they use for every five watts of heat, they dissipate, they use one watt in return. Of the company, this is the hard part for me, he's gonna correct me if I'm wrong, or four, F four, I just can't do it. The, the dry, dry CES <laughs> environment has got to my throat. It's four systems. Four systems. Yeah. Uh, and I will say uh, at CES, among the thousands of vendors, this might be one of the coolest things I've seen here, um, and that is AirJet. We actually wrote about this on PC World. You can go read a story written by uh, my coworker, Mark Hockman, in words, but it's oh, better wow. to hear it from the horse's mouth. And this, he was uh, instrumental in creating it. We're gonna talk about yeah. Airjet. What is this for the, the, the viewer from the internet? What, what does this do exactly? Well, we are a Silicon Valley startup that's four years old. And we set out to create the world's first solid state active cooling chip. Solid state active cooling chip. And the amazing thing is this is what cools jet engines as well this technology is implemented into jet engines but 
on our level it's not the fans over there that in in the distance that you can see it's it's like a little nvme drive but there's a little demo part where they showcase show it moving a rotating thing that can be blown and or moving a ball and you don't see the ball uh example in this video here but it's so powerful guys and the technology is just it, it blows your mind you have to like just listen to this and you will not be led astray this is going to be implemented this can be implemented with phones into notebooks really thin devices but also it scaled it would be an amazing thing to have in our desktop pcs as well i believe so when you look at thermal in uh, any compute device uh, typically active cooling is done using fans if you have a fan you got active cooling or if you don't have a fan then you're limited to passive cooling which is actually a much lower thermal level and the type of thermal cooling you have in a device essentially dictates the performance you're going to get on that device. Uh, you know, the, your processor could be very uh, high caliber, right. but if your thermal design is not good, then right. you would only get 50%, in some cases, even only 25% of the total performance that the processor is actually capable of. So this has been a big problem in computing right. for many years now. And so we asked the question, why do you have to depend on 100-year-old fan technology to cool these 21st century devices? Okay. Why can't we create a chip? So it's took a, taken us four years, but now we've got this ready. This is and the Airjet. Airjet air Mini, right? This is the Mini This versions. is the Mini. And this is uh, the world's first solid state active cooling chip. You know, when people hear solid state, they're like, well, what is in there? So like... So you're, this basically replaces a fan. That's right. And you're sucking the air, you're, you're, you're moving air somehow. What is the magic that you make this chip out of? Well, this chip is you know 2.8 millimeters in thickness, but there's a lot of complexity that goes inside this chip. There's actually a cavity inside the chip in which we got vibrating membranes. Okay. Uh, How these are MEMS membranes. And uh, as they vibrate, they create this huge suction force, what we call back pressure, that pulls air through the, the holes at the top of the chip. Pulsating okay. jets. And then that air is pushed down and it hits the copper heat spreader at very high velocities, up to 200 kilometers per hour of pulsating jets, we call them. And that is an excellent way of extracting heat. Uh, because you're able to break through the so-called boundary layer. And so you're able to ex extract heat from this hot copper surface with high efficiency, and then the hot air exits sideways. That's the exhaust. Look, the, look at the that. Of the look chair. at that, guys. So the, but the boundary layer you're talking about, that is... Okay. So that's that's something powerful. It's called the air jet. Um, back pressure versus a traditional fan of 17, 17, 1,750 PA versus a traditional fan of just 195 PA. And, and just that's just a small version of this. And it's also silent versus a traditional fan, which would be like 42 decibel. And they, they end up screaming like, and just imagine the redesigning of things, the cooling, the capabilities of phones and stuff and how that would run. You know, you could have really, really powerful gaming phones. So this is a real massive thing. Check it out on PC World. It's got like 1.8 million views now. Like this is massive. In relation to PC World, if you have a look at their largest videos, for example, I'll, I'll show you guys something right now. If we go into their videos and go into popular, okay, they have 7.4 million 2.2 million, 2 million, and then 1.6 million 11 days ago. Now, these 2 million ones is like from 14 years ago, okay? And otherwise, you got these from four or five years ago. And apart from that, it's been a number of years since they've had a major hit. And the future of cooling after 11 days has rocketed into this level and pristine so this is this is massive because if pc world's got such uh widespread coverage and or this has been pushed so far everyone's like this this is it this is this is happening this isn't just a startup it's going to be bought out by fan manufacturers this is going to happen at some point it's going to be really really cool stuff so uh yeah look out for that y'all
That being said, and that leads us into essentially something else that's pretty cool. Uh, maybe not cooling, but that is. Is it true? Is it true, people? Welcome back. Welcome to the Technus Corner. So, is it true, people? I've got myself this e. So, I am not going to over talk myself talking, but is it true, people? Essentially, what we've got here is a throwback of something really, really cool. And that's that the Alpha wireless headphones, which I've got on currently, the HyperX variants, they are something really, really cool as well because they have a battery life of 300 hours on wireless. And I've been testing these. So there's a review up on the Technus Corner of an unboxing video, as you can see here, that you guys can subscribe to. It might be in the description below as well. Uh, sorry, that, that you guys can uh, have a look at and see the unboxing of. But I've been wearing these now for a number of days. And yeah, they are really, really comfy. And I've got another headset, which drew me to... I'm a sucker for long battery life. I've got another headset that has 100 hours. These ones have 300 hours. And when I turn, when it turns itself off and on at times when there's no audio, right? Uh, when it turns back on, it's still on 100%. It's still on 100% a day later. Do you know what I mean? So that's really, <laughs> that's something to check out, guys. Because I tell you what, um, I wanted to mention something which I don't mention in the unboxing and overview of this headset. And that's that. Uh, why don't normally say higher battery life, like 300 hours on headphones exist rather than 30 hours, okay? And that's pretty much because wireless headphones rely on batteries to function and battery life of a pair of headphones is determined by a number of factors, including the size of the battery, the power consumption of the headphones and the intended use of the headphones. One of the main reasons that wireless headphones may not have a battery life as long as 300 hours is because of the size of the battery. In order to achieve a longer battery life, the headphones would need to have a larger battery, which would increase the size and weight of the headphones. There's also battery technology, which is diminished and sometimes not mentioned, but this may not be practical or desirable for many users. Another reason for shorter battery life is the power consumption of the headphones. Wireless headphones use energy to transmit a signal to and from the device they are paired with and this process can be energy intensive additionally features such as active noise cancelling and wireless charging can also drain the battery more quickly finally the intended use of the headphones can also affect battery life if the headphones are intended for use during long flights or for extended periods of time the manufacturer may prioritize a longer battery life over other features on the other hand if the headphones are intended for more casual use the manufacturer may prioritize other features such as sound quality or design over battery life so in relation to this headset that's on my head currently for example these awesome little things um here they are right here I just don't like the red on them, honestly, but there's HyperX. And they do have a detachable detachable microphone. So don't forget about that. Very pliable. And these are very comfy. But honestly, when it comes to these, they sacrificed having 53 millimeter neo diamond drivers to only 50 millimeter drivers. So some people say that these are a bit low, but for the flat sound that I need, for long periods of time and listening i don't have them for higher than 20 or 30 percent anyway so that's something to consider you all and yeah if if you guys are interested in getting a headset that has 300 hour battery life it's not a gimmick it's the real real deal people and yeah that essentially concludes what is the rest of the news uh picking us up in, in the last month or so of relevant topics um, in the PC genre and subspace, except for maybe one other thing, which honestly, there's enough out there in relation to this that you guys will understand. And honestly, if you try to get on what is, I'll say, 
chat GBT, or if you've not heard of it before, chat GBT, then yeah, at least I'll explain to you what was I just try to jump on before to get show you guys an example of it, but I'll explain the status of chat GBT in um, what is the style of Shakespeare, because that's what chat GBT managed to tell me, um, at least its status, and that is, ah, dear user of chat GBT, foul art not alone in thy desire to engage with our esteemed AI chatbot. Many have flocked to our website in this hour, and we do our utmost to accommodate each and every one. Yet alas, our resources are not without limit, and we must ask for thy patience and forbearance. In time, we shall be able to provide thee with access to chat GBT. Until then, we beg thee to return at a future juncture when we may better serve thy needs. Until then, we bid the adieu and good fortune and that's essentially enough said on chat gbt if you can manage to get onto it it's ai chat gbt it's a th something that got funded originally by elon musk out of all people and a lot of money is being poured into um, what is chat gbt now but it's based for gbt3 modeling but gbt3 become gbt4 and it just gets stronger and stronger and yeah it, it can do some powerful stuff so if you guys haven't heard about this look up chat gbt in your spare time now this is the end of united in tech podcast number four people thanks for joining us and yeah sorry about the ums and ahs i'm just getting warmed up again i will have more current information for you guys in the next week or two and i'll be up to date with information pressing forward so thanks for joining us at the Technus Corner for United in Tech podcast number four. Peace out, guys. Bye.